In the late 1990s, a website cropped up onto the internet feeding us information about an urban legend known as the Blair Witch. Following that, a documentary giving us insight about three film students who went missing in the year 1994. All of this came in the build-up for a new movie known as The Blair Witch Project. The creators went out of their way to make a world so close to reality, it caused moviegoers to question whether or not the movie was real or fiction. Just like usual, I like to have a look at the viral marketing campaigns that go into movies and explore some of the lore that may have not made it into the movie itself. Strap yourself in, we're traveling back all the way to 1999 to explore the universe of the Blair Witch Project. On October 20th, 1994, three film students, Heather, Mike, and Josh, head into the Black Hills Forest to make a film documenting the history of the Blair Witch. Five days go by, and they don't return. An APB is issued, and they later find Josh's car parked on Black Rock Road just outside of the forest. The Maryland State Police launch a search party of the Black Hills area, but there is no sign of the students. It isn't long before the search party is called off, and we don't hear about anything of the students for a full year. In 1995, someone discovers a duffel bag found underground in an old cottage that is believed to be over 100 years old. This uh, backpack was found in, in a sterile soil which is like the bottom of a site, it's just, you know, from there to the middle of the earth is just dirt. The original house at the site had burned down, and so there was a layer of ash that was like sitting in, in the interior of the house, like the basement. So this, this knapsack had been in sterile soil uh, with no evidence around it of disturbance. Along, over the top of it was an undisturbed layer of ash, and the whole thing was boxed in by uh, a, uh, basically a colonial era wall uh, that was undisturbed. Even a forensic expert could not have put that thing into the site without disturbing the charcoal, the wall, or sterile soil. Inside the bag, we discover footage featuring the last few days of the three filmmakers' lives. Along with that, we find their autobiographies, all found on the Blair Witch website. Each one gives us a whole backstory behind the three characters and how each one ended up filming this documentary with the other two students. But the most interesting part about discovering the duffel bag is the journal they found that was written by Heather. Inside, it gives some explanations for a few of the misunderstandings people have about the Blair Witch mythos. A few fans have said in the comments on other videos when I was doing research for this video that the Blair Witch will only harm you if you trespass on her land. She never tries to lure anyone, and that's why some people are disappointed with the sequel to the movie. But that's incorrect. The witch actually chooses her victims very carefully and lures them to her forest where she can do whatever she wishes wishes with them. In Heather's journal, you'll see multiple times the name Ellie Kedward mentioned. This is the name of the Blair Witch herself. According to the mythology section of the website, during 1785, there used to be a small town located in Maryland called Blair, where a woman known as Ellie Kedward was accused by several children of witchcraft. They claimed that she was luring them to her home to draw blood from them. Throughout the documentary, however, we learned that Ellie Kedward could have been using witchcraft to try and save the town from disease that was spreading throughout at the time. The story goes that she had bled a few children and by that pinpricks, um, probably because of some sort of illness that she detected or something to that effect. Unfortunately, this was an era when people did not accept any kind of magic. And when they found out what she was doing, they banished her from the town. They tied her down and left her to die in the middle of the forest. It wasn't until a year later that all children who had accused her had mysteriously vanished along with the people who participated in leaving her to die. The town panicked and quickly fled the area believing it was cursed land and decided to never mention the name Ellie Kedward ever again. During Heather's journal, she mentions multiple times about a connection she feels with Ellie Kedward, the Blair Witch. I can't explain the kingship I feel with her. She will get through. I cannot see how she can avoid perceiving the energy I am sending her way, and have been for two years now. 
Two years is underlined and even includes a close-up of the words to signify its importance to the story. Maybe I'm obsessed. In any case, there are worse things to be obsessed about. She isn't just deciding to make this documentary because she found it interesting. She's creating this documentary because something is drawing her into the forest. From my understanding, it seems that for the past two years, the Blair Witch has been planting thoughts inside Heather's head and was luring her into the forest to be the next victim. If you pay attention to the mythology page and remove all minor events and only include the times where the Blair Witch has appeared and kidnapped someone, you'll notice it only happens almost every 50 years. Okay, not exactly 50 years, but there's always a good 40 to 60 year gap in between disappearances. It's even mentioned in the Blair Witch documentary. <clears throat> it seemed like that, that, uh, that this, this, this something happens about every 50 or 60 years to make the Blair Witch Theory continue on. Something so minor that could easily be overlooked as a throwaway line, but in fact, could explain why Heather has had a connection between the Blair Witch for the past two years. Before Heather, Mike, and Josh went missing in the woods, the last time someone actually went missing, according to the mythology page, was back in 1941, where a man had religiously killed seven children inside the forest. We can find short interviews of this man on the Blair Witch website and the documentary itself. Mr. Parr, you've been sentenced to death. Do you feel this is fair? Yes. Mr. Parr, do you think God has forgiven you? Yes. This man was called Rustin Parr. He never really had a family growing up and seemed to enjoy being by himself. The woods was a nice place for him to be alone and away from everyone else. So, in his early 20s, he made the decision to go off and live in the woods by himself. He built a home, which was a four hours walk away from any civilization, and was remembered by a lot of people in the village at the time as someone who was happy with his life choices. However, it wasn't long after before he started to see things. Rustin liked to have long walks in the forest and take in the new sights that he may come across or just watch nature go by. Although one day he recalls taking a walk and sees a woman in the distance. He wasn't really terrified. He was just concerned on why she was alone and wanted to know if she was okay. So he tried calling out to her, moving towards her, asking if she was okay, but she vanished before he got any closer. Thinking nothing of it, he went about his merry way. Days began to pass and Rusting would still take his long walks, but sightings of the woman became much more frequent. After a few weeks of the recurring sightings, Rusting knew something was not right. That's when the nightmares began. The sound of a woman's voice appearing in his head and torturing him. He would wake up and realize it was just a dream until one day he started hearing the voice while he was awake. It lasted for a good few years and the voice inside his head decided to make a deal. The voice told him the only way she would stop is if he would do exactly as she asked. At this point, she had driven him to insanity and he would do anything just to make her leave. So on November of 1940, she asked him to journey down into the town and begin kidnapping children, taking them back to his home in the woods before religiously killing them. In 1941, he would then walk into the town and just admit to what he has done. And the witch happily left him alone, but by then it was too late. This is just another case of Ellie Kedward choosing her victims. Rustin Parr moved into the forest in his mid twenties. He was 38 in 1941, and he didn't start seeing the witch until a few years before the killings, meaning he must have spent a good portion of his time in the forest without being touched or disturbed by the witch. It was only around the 50 year mark where she decided to show up and begin tormenting him. And even then it wasn't Rustin she wanted, it was the children. Rustin was just caught in the middle of this, just like Josh and Mike. And if we go back even further, another 50 years or so to 1886, a child known as Robin Weaver went missing for several days, causing search parties to be sent out into the woods. But not too long after, Robin actually returned unharmed. Unfortunately, one of the search parties weren't so lucky. After the group hadn't returned for a few weeks, it caused another search party to head out into the woods in order to find them. 
And they did, but they were too late. The first search party had been killed, laid out on a flat rock in the woods. When the search party discovered them, they rushed back home to get more help. But when they returned, the bodies had gone. She knew a search party would come looking for him, and those were the ones that ended up being the victims. A couple of other stories take place early on, but nothing as big as the ones I've covered. And I think you already know the outcome. It was all planned. These three film students weren't just unlucky, the witch lured them into the woods, just like she did with several of her past victims. She chooses who she wants to take. Even in the sequel, she lures Heather's brother by releasing footage of a house on the internet. The Blair Witch Project did a fantastic job at creating this realistic world, and even though the movie may not hold up as well as it did back in the past, considering it's been officially confirmed as fictional, I think it'll be remembered in a similar way to Avengers Infinity War. It was more of an event than a movie. It's almost impossible to capture how people felt watching this film back in 1999 compared to how you'd view it now because nothing like that had really happened before. So I will always find it much more fascinating to admire its point in history and everything it did to get there, rather than just solely focusing on the movie itself. <laughs> Jeez, that's a bit bright. I think I've got myself in focus. Thank you guys so much for watching. Feel free to leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more. I, uh, sorry that there hasn't been much uploads. Uh, I, I, know, I know the Blair Witch Project, a lot of people know about the website and stuff, but I know I know a lot of people who don't know much about the website either. So I, f I figured it'd be good for, for those people who don't don't know about it. And uh, yeah, just wanted to do to do that kind of thing as I got a little comeback video, so to speak, or at least since there's not been much uploaded. Since they're not uploading, I thought I might as well upload. Uh, and um, yeah. Uh,